implementing the first rapid HIV testing program and routine HIV testing for pregnant women presenting to the hospital without a documented HIV test. <clears throat> Mr. Henry served as the Ryan White Part C coordinator and public relations officer at the Fredrickson Healthcare Inc. in St. Croix. In his role, he was instrumental in implementing the, 30, the 340B medication assistance program, allowing clients to access medication at a low cost while increasing revenue for the health center. Mr. Henry has also traveled to Santo Domingo volunteering his time working with orphans of HIV AIDS parents. Mr. Henry was invited in 2010 by President Barack Obama for the unveiling of the nation's first ever national HIV AIDS strategy. He also served as an advisory member to the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors team in Zambia, working to develop and implement various <coughs> HIV strategies. Mr. Jason Henry. audience may have already known that the Centers for Disease, um, Disease uh, CDC and Prevention has a 10-year plan to eradicate HIV virus in 10 years. So moving along, the first question is basically, what is HIV and how is it different than AIDS? Um, okay, yeah. since you're closest to the mic. <laughs> yeah. HIV is a immune deficiency in the mind. It's very 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 in the virus. virus. And as most of you know, virus is very different from the bacteria. They can't live on their own. You know, mosquitoes don't make water dirty, they look dirty water. Bring it back a little closer to your eyes. Viruses are different than bacteria. Uh, a very good way to think about that mosquitoes don't make water dirty, they look for dirty water. And it's not that the host body of the virus of HIV, the immunodeficient uh, virus, is dirty, but what it does, it insinuates itself. It's like, I like you. And then they get inside the DNA of your cell, and then they take over and kind of tell messenger RNA, just make copies of me. I'm a good guy. And then it begins to take over your body. If, and it can go unnoticed very easily until you start getting symptoms. If the symptoms persist and the virus take a big hold of your body, then you move on to AIDS. And so that's one reason uh, we work very feverishly for people to first understand that it is not a gay person's disease. It has now become black folks disease and it affects everyone. And black women are now 55% at least of the new HIV virus cases. And many of them are in relationship with professional men, with deacons in church, with your neighbor, with your friends, and you can't see it. Profession, status in society, personal accomplishments do not protect you against HIV. Jason, so as Makeda just talked about, it doesn't matter about your, uh, your status in, in society, your class, um, but she did mention some statistics about how it's affecting persons of color. Um, I did read on the CDC that persons of color is more affected um, because of the, their lack of ability to get treatment, um, especially that we're living in a territory that is not, you know, we're not close to the continental U.S. How does that affect our community the most? Well, it, how does it affect people with regards to the access treatment? Yeah. Well, first, what I really want to say, actually, we do have the capabilities of providers to keep it here in the territory. And 
the agencies here, such as Federal Health and Public Health, have qualified and capable people providing the care. We have the medication and people living longer with the virus. As Makeda just recently explained, the difference between HIV and AIDS, as indicated, when an individual HIV is a virus and AIDS is a disease, when an individual actually transmit, transforms to AIDS, an average person, the immune system is about 1,500. However, when you get to AIDS is when your viral load, sorry, your CD4 is wet from about 1,500 to 200. So anything 200 below, that's how you test virus AIDS. However, as healthcare providers, our goal when we have someone who's HIV positive is to keep that CD4 above 200 so they could remain keep that care. So individuals have access to care. But what the challenge is, it's not the access to care, the challenge is the stigma associated with, with, with it. Because individuals are afraid to go in to get care because guess what? That it, it, what don't care what the problem really is. As a community, we have sex but we don't want to talk about sex. Right? And so as a result of that, so we hear that someone is HIV positive, then you try to figure out, oh, I wonder how she get it. I wonder how you get it. Oh, he had to be doing this, or she had to be doing that. So the issue is not the treatment. The issue is the stigma that's associated yeah. with individuals yeah. Yeah. accessing care. We speak about the LGBT community, and we said that this was a gay man disease, and it was the white gay men back when HIV first came out. Why do you think the white gay men are the healthiest out there? Because they are not afraid. Right? Our people have to start stigmatizing each other. Mm -hmm. So fear. Fear is what's stopping us from accessing the correct prevention and actual recovery. Okay, and so talking about that, I just want to give this next person a round of applause, Miss Sherry, for even having the the gall to inform everybody of your status. I mean, as you can see, she's a beautiful woman, living healthy. As you read in her bio, she came to St. Croix from New Jersey to build a family. And so, can you tell me about your experience um, being an HIV advocate and also being a person here living with HIV in the Virgin Islands? Thank you so much. Good evening, all. It's so Good nice evening. to be here. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, FAT, Department of Health, and all the supporters. We really appreciate you all. My name is Sherry Hennigan, and I have been living with HIV for 30 years. It took a long time for me to get to this point where I could say to anyone that I run into in the public, in a public setting, that yes, I am a person living with HIV, and we are just like you. The only thing is that we have a virus, an illness in our body, that we need medication to keep it in control and undetectable. And we are just like you. We are one and the same. When I first came to St. Croix in 1988, I was just so excited and happy to be here, to be somewhere where it was hot all year round because I come from somewhere where it's cold, and this was like a godsend for me. But as soon as we got here, my fiance got sick. He was already sick, unbeknownst to me, when we left uh, from the States. But when we got here, he got deadly ill. And he was back and forth to the doctor all the time. And his mom finally took him to Puerto Rico, and that's when he was diagnosed with HIV in May of 1989. He was totally devastated. Naturally, he had to come back home to St. Cory to tell me that I had to go be tested because I might also be in with HIV. I did go to the uh, lab here in St. Croix. I was in Plaza at that time. There wasn't too many places here available. And I tested HIV. And I don't know if you all heard me screaming. If I thought the world had came to an end, I thought I died and everything was just so shattered for me. I just didn't know what to do, what to think, how to feel. His mother had told us, don't tell anyone that we were HIV positive. Don't tell his family. Don't tell my family. So it was, I was living in silence and secrets all of that time until I couldn't take it anymore. I drank Cruz and Rum, which I can't stand today, for about <laughs> two weeks straight. 
every time I thought about it, I just got me from Cruiser Rome to just vacate and don't think about it. And then I decided that I cannot live like this. I do want to live. That's when I reached out to the CDC over the phone on the hotline, and they gave me a lot of information. And I told them that we didn't have a provider here, we didn't have HIV meds here, and they referred me to a doctor back home in New Jersey, which I would go back and forth to for 10 years. Now when I was diagnosed, the doctor uh, told me that I can live with HIV for 10 years. So I lived like I was dead for 10 years in silence and secrets, and I was just dying inside. By now, my fiance had died because we was only together down here for a year. He brought me to a place where I had never heard of before. I heard of St. Thomas, but I never heard of St. Croix. And he just literally left me here. He didn't tell me what he was doing when he was in, in the States, how did he think he got infected with HIV. He wouldn't tell me anything. He would just cry every time I tell him, ask him, how did you get this? What were you doing? You didn't just get this. Because when we were diagnosed, his CD4 was at the number 10. So he was already in the stages of AIDS, already. And he just willed himself to die. And on December 27, 1990, he died, leaving me here all alone with no blood family. But family is not determined by blood, which I've learned throughout these 31 years of being on this island. Family is not determined by blood. My family was having a fit. They wanted me to come home, come home immediately. They wanted to kill him. I said, don't even worry about him. He's a dead man already. So no need to come down here to kill him because he's not going to make it. He's, the stigma was so high and this discrimination and it was just so shame and so embarrassing. It was just awful and I was trying to tell him, hold on, hold on, help is coming, help is coming. Back in those days in the early 90s, the only thing it was was the medication AZT. Come to find out years later, it was the ACT that killed all of those in the beginning of the epidemic that killed them out. And I was trying to tell him to hold on because help is coming, we're going to get help. We're gonna get help. I wasn't sick at all. And I wanted to stay when my family was trying to get me to come back. I said, no, I wanna stay. If for one thing, I can't leave him here like this. You know, he's sick now. I have to stay here with him. And I don't wanna get back up there in the cold. And I wanna meet other people like myself. So I set out on a mission to meet other people like myself. And unfortunately, that first group of people that I met are no longer here with us. I'm the only one from that group left. <laughs> honor you for staying here, and I honor the persons that, you know, have um, lost your brother. But also, um, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about those persons and, and, and how possibly the advances that has worked for you, um, the, the strides that were, were taken for persons to get medication that fit their body and their needs. We have come a long, long way here in the Virgin Islands. We only started getting medication in the year 2000. So that's only 19 years in the medication. Right now we have some awesome care. We have choices that we can go to. You can go to the Frederick said Healthcare, you can go to the Department of Health. The staff is wonderful, compassionate, loving. They'll educate you, they'll talk to you, they'll be there with you by your side. You don't have to be ashamed, you don't have to be afraid. So it's these people that keep me grounded when I know that I have that support and that love that I can conquer anything. Frederick said Healthcare! Department of Health, of course. <laughs> well, we just talked a little bit, Sheree, about uh, discrimination. My next question is for Chris. As a millennial and a very popular person here in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> um, what discrimination have you received for being an HIV advocate, and how have you been able to deal with that? That's a good question. Good evening, everyone. Um, the number one discrimination I've, I've heard or I've received um, 
with somebody knowing that I'm in working in the field is number one, you're gay. Um, because you have that stigma that HIV only comes from gay people. Um, whether I am or not is none of anybody's business. But, <laughs> I mean, that that's one. Um, another one is whether you have the virus yourself or you must have the virus. So because you have the virus, you're the reason. You want to give awareness and make sure that the community is safe so that you won't, you can repent kind of or give back for your sins, quote unquote. Um, so it, 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 it starts off from both of those. So being an uh, LGBT male or being somebody who's HIV positive. Um, and I actually got into it being bored. I literally like being bored at school, from school on our days off, when we had holidays or any extra days that we was off. I used to go to work with my mother and make um, safer sex kits and go out in the field and promote people to get tested. And this was the age of 11. Um, where I became a certified educator at 15 and my passion and my dedication and seeing my mom um, in the field and seeing the passion that she had for it and then just wanting to hear the message out there it's, it's just something that touched me so 18 years later I'm still in the game. Healthy person is just like you started off because your mom, mom worked for the Department of Health um, so how do persons who want to be involved, could, how could they get involved? Uh, I would say volunteer. That, that's the best way to get your foot in a door. That's the best way to get any knowledge, any resources. If you don't, if you're not knowledgeable about something, volunteer in an organization that you want to gain that access. From volunteering, you can go into internship. From internship, you can go into a part-time job. From a part-time job, going to full-time and moving on up in the ranks. Um, like Mr. Jason. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah, so, so just to add two things. One, the stigma and then how do you get involved? Yes, uh, similar as well too. Everyone, when I worked, when I actually was at the first head care, it was always like, hmm, why is he showing up to that person? Does that person have HIV? You know, and so it's like, it started to become where I got involved in many other things as well too, because what happened was like, as soon as you started working with an individual, everyone just assumed that that person was HIV positive. And so, it also is challenging, and then everyone had to think that you were either gay as well too, or that you also had the virus, and just a kid. And like him as well, I got involved with HIV work by volunteering. When I met, that's my other one. My first job in HIV, actually, I walked in there and says, actually, I was working in American Red Cross, and I said, I would like to volunteer. And they said, no, nope, uh, we don't have any volunteer position, but we have a job. I'm like, no, nope, I already have a job. I just want to volunteer. And, Somehow I went from 5 hours to 15 hours to 20 hours to 40 hours and here I am still doing work in HIV. And so if you're really passionate about it, uh, just we have a lot of entities that you can come and volunteer at. at St. Vincent's Hospital. And he would come home, you know, my, uh, I'm the youngest of five, and he would talk about this virus. And he, he felt it was a retrovirus, came from that, something that came back. But he, he was busy trying to find out how and why it came. And because the first 600 cases were in New York at St. Vincent's Hospital in, uh, in, in the village, it became associated with homosexuality because 66% of the cases were in homosexual men. And it became associated with high D because the one commonality that they had was that they had gone on a cheap Caribbean vacation. But what they did when their further search is that they found that what brought the commonality in these men was that they went seeking sexual flavors and they themselves took the virus to Haiti and then came back. If you remember, there was a big thing about Haitian, and I, I don't know if you guys remember that. And it, 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 it was a very terrible thing. And uh, 
I had been living in East Africa in 1972, working, and I'd gone to Uganda, and they had this disease they called the slimming disease. Um, I had first been teaching in Tanzania and went to work with this African-American doctor that had moved to uh, Uganda to work under Mbote because he had originally been working with Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. And he, uh, I was interested in that work. Not knowing, I didn't even know what the slimming disease was. It was simply, you got slim and you died. At that time, no one knew that there wasn't even a word. This was 1972. And this virus became, it was in the late 70s and the 80s, and those first original cases. Now, fast forward today, it is a black person's disease. Of the new cases of HIV, we are the ones, and it speaks to the stigma, it speaks to the miseducation, and it speaks to the fact of us being unable to talk about sex. Well, I'm going to talk about sex. I love, I mean, sex is us. And it's how we're here. I mean, you don't get here like the cow jump over the moon and all these other stories and lies. They tell us first we have to get out of that stuff. Okay? Where are we getting this disease if it's in our communities? It's in our churches. It's in our schools. My, uh, my nephew, um, Greg Millet, who's now the director, my brother's son, is now the director of AMFAR, and I'm proud to say he was the leading researcher on President Obama's agenda for AIDS in the United States. He's the one that wrote it. He worked um, with President Obama for about four years. And I've learned a lot from him and from my brother and my experiences working as an HIV provider in East Africa, where the disease was is primarily a heterosexual disease that has cultural context in terms of men being able to go and sleep with whomever they choose, and their wives are not being able to say no. And one other tidbit of information I would like to share. Our little Virgin Islands, little Virgin Islands, for people that don't talk about sex and go to church every day, where HIV exists, have the second highest incidence of chlamydia in the entire United States. So someone's making love around these islands. <laughs> okay, so to have the second highest incidence of a sexually transmitted disease in the entire United States speaks loads to the work that we have to do. Each one teach one. I am public health. Giving a pill or giving somebody treatment is not because that health is not the absence of disease. That's the word. I wish I could take credit for that. That's from the World Health Organization. It states that health is not only the absence of disease, but it's a person's emotional, social, community, the person's ability to take care of themselves and provide for their families. There are all these social determinants of health. So even though we have the best treatment, if we can't get the word out, and people are not aware, people are not being tested, people are having unprotected sex because you come from a good family, you go to church. <laughs> we are gonna not only become one in chlamydia, but we're soon gonna creep up to maybe being very close. In terms of population, when you may check out for other variables, high in HIV. So we need volunteers, we need people to go into the communities. We need education from the kindergarten all the way up to the presidency. Okay, so uh, when we get back, as we're going for a little break, we're going to hear from some of our community members with spoken word by Ms. Paranuma Ad Kahina Davis. But HIV can be a sexually transmitted, can be sexually transmitted, but undetectable. So when we get back, we can start talking about that. And next, we're going to have Ms. Hanuma Ad. Thank you, guys. I feel at times it's important to love the people as they're living, 
So this is actually something that I wrote about someone near and dear to my heart. And you can start the instrumental at any time. Her name is Luz and she teaches others how to win by reminding us to keep in mind either you are going to be a victim or a victor, a catastrophe or a catalyst to help one another that can set the tone and change your entire mindset. Her name is Luz and she teaches others how to win with informed education, helping family members and friends understand how to accept rejection. Yes, rejection, stigma, and judgments can leave a sinking feeling in the pit of our existence. It reminds your heart to keep beating in an optimistic beat. You shake the dust off and you keep it moving. Her name is Luz and she teaches others how to win. Your purpose will override the pain. Do not shrink yourself and hide. Do not disappear and try to go back in time. You're picking apart the details the moment before each of you walk through your door and without a single knock at the entrance it said, hello, do you need me in your life a little bit more? Her name is Luz and she reminded me how to win. She reminded me about the importance of what a stable mind can lead to a life of good health for adjusting your environment, your diet and exercise. It is the best form of medicine that her ancestors bring into our lives. Her name is Luz and she reminded me how to win. Women of strength show courage in the midst of fear, declaring triumph through faith and understanding of who you are within. Her name is Luz, a woman of strength who concerns herself not with the judgments of others that will not allow the business of others to interfere with the commitments as a voice living in advocacy for others and not to allow them to live and reside and die in silence. Her name is Luz and she teaches others how to win. Luz, a woman of strength that realizes life's mistakes no longer make her slim while thanking God for the blessings that she capitalizes on them. A woman of strength who knows that the creator will catch her when she falls, reminding others that within the journey is where life will make you strong. And the love of the creator is forever within you, no matter how difficult or long. Her name is Luz, the woman who teaches others how to win. A woman of strength who will compromise as a little give and take is needed. Why? Because a lesson not learned the first time soon is to be repeated a second. Her name is Luz. And she reminds us how to win. A reminder to start with prayer each and every day, even if some of your choices make you go astray. You must trust and believe that the Creator will always be with you from here to there. Every human being is a catalyst for any little boy or little girl to become the same. And if there is a critical lesson to be taken from this sensitive work, it is that there is a need for a new approach to conceptualizing literacy, one that considers how the cultural legacy of bringing about social change through narrative and the arts can be the mobilization of the central to youth and HIV AIDS education. Her name is Luz and she teaches others how to win. Your current position is not your final destination. Everything in life has a beginning and an ending. You're the only one who can ultimately discern where you fit in. She's a reminder of all the people who are suffering, a reminder of the importance of never forgetting what it means to stop letting your words bury you with silence in fear of living in a society with miseducation. The work is not easy. The work is not easy. I'll repeat it again. The work is not easy. And the dedicated activists at the forefront of this war are not a walkover. Even though the victims of circumstances are not the easiest to manage, everyone who has contributed anything towards ending this epidemic, I thank you for your patience. You are keeping millions of souls alive with your what apathy and your ambition. Her name is Luz and she reminded others how to win. She reminds others how to win. You are keeping millions of souls alive within you. What remains all of us, we all hold the key. Whether positive or negative, HIV AIDS will only end with our combined efforts. It's up to us to utilize efforts and our responsibility, you and me, to stop the continuous spread of HIV, to stop stigmatizing HIV victims of circumstance, and to support them before and after disclosure. Luz, the woman who teaches others how to end stigmatization from within. Thank you. So we just want to get back into the conversation um, because Ms. Makeda, you touched on a lot of points and so it led us to the next question is HIV can be sexually transmitted but undetectable viral loads, a low level of the virus in your system effectively eliminates any chance of passing it on sexually. 
What would you say to people who say you or other people living with HIV should not be able to have sex? That's a very big topic because um, I don't think, maybe we should start off on some education because I don't think persons recognize that you can have HIV but be your, your viral loads are so low that you're undetectable. So maybe we should like, start off with some education about that. simply means that when we test for your viral load that they can't it is so non-existent that they are less than 20 copies of the virus in your system so they can't say zero because technically there's no cure but if they can't find any copies of the virus you are undetectable or less than 20 you're undetectable so I'm going to this conference on Tuesday. I love it. It's one of the best conferences I've been on. It's for clinicians and HIV. And I recall when I went there, was it two years ago? I might have been there, because I didn't go last year. It might have been two or three years ago. Back then, they were saying undetectable is untransmitted. And um, not only that, they were really, because we have come a long way, like my sister said. I love her. She's, um, she's a very, she, she's very much an inspiration because what she does and have done takes a lot of courage on an island like this. Because we are even trying to instill professionalism amongst the staff, not to, you know, stop the gossip and the judgment. You are professional. What happens in your workplace happens in your workplace. And doesn't exist and we have to address it. Yep. And so, uh, and, and I just want to tell Sh Sherry, is come, you know, she's done a lot for our community yeah. and continues to do a lot and it's an honor to have her come visit me and, and talk and share. But coming back to, to, to your point, uh, unlike hep, hep C, we have now found a cure for Hep C and it was once considered but the difference between Hep C and Hep and HIV is that Hep C did not take, does not take over. I mean, does not take over the nucleus of its of the cell. It does not take over the nucleus of itself of the cell. So if you can stem it, because it doesn't, that's why we have found a cure. But HIV, it takes over your cell. So the medication we give keeps it at bay so that it does not replicate and take over your entire body, leading to a disease state. And then we get the CD4 cells. They're the soldiers. They're the ones that tell you that you, the mosquitoes are biting you, but I'm going to send out some of the privates to deal with that, and you recognize that that's not a problem anymore. You know, and one of the things, interestingly, I've learned my, my patients that are off medication, one of the things that brings them back is that the mosquitoes start biting them and they can't protect themselves against it. And I said, well, why? Because that's how they know because their defenses are down. The CD4, the general, has been depleted. And so when we get the general in control and we can build back up your total CD4 count, keep you within normal limits, and keep this percentage of all the fighters in your body because your body is set up to protect you. And even when we get disease, it's there because the body is telling you, hey, you, 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 you got it. your body is very inflamed, you, you, you're sick. And that's your body protecting you, all right? So it is there to tell you a message. So that's why it's important to get tested and not one test. Okay, you have to keep testing. Well, That's the thing, you, and you have to take your medication every day. And I'm told that we are now having clinical trials of a once a month injection. I'll learn, I'll learn more about that when I go on Tuesday to this conference, which okay. I love to go to. So Chris, can you tell me, uh, since you said you have to keep getting testing, can you give us some more like dates, uh, days I should say, um, where testing is being, um, is, is occurring? with the Federal State Health Clinic, if days that persons would come in and get tested, or if organizations want to bring in testing into their workplaces or institutions. 
So we're open Monday to Friday at our Saturday. house. Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> Saturday. And Saturday as well. Uh, we offer free confidential HIV testing. You get your results right then and there in less than 10 minutes. Um, everything is completely, completely, completely confidential. So whatever stays in that room that you talk about, whatever you speak about in that room stays in that room. We don't go any further than that. Um, which is something that I think our community needs to know because that's a fear that once they walk into the clinic, they're going to be spotted. Once they be, once they see somebody getting an HIV test, they're already a pinpoint to have an HIV or AIDS. Um, so yeah, we also come onto the community in our mobile testing unit, so you can give us a call at. Uh, I give you the number of seven, seven. <laughs> uh, You give us a call, we'll come out and um, do free HIV testing. Number. We could get that number from somebody. Number? Number? 772 0260. 772. Here we go. Say it for us. Yeah, so, first head kit number 772 0260. I don't know your extension. 249. 249. Thank you. And. 249. Similar to what you. One. Is this the clinic? Can you tell someone who's HIV positive to stop having sex? No. No. Um, that's their right. Have sex. I mean, what's the conversation that you should have with your with your well, partners? What you, well, what you should be encouraging them to do is to protect themselves, to protect their loved one, and that's why we have you equals you. And in an individual is positive. The goal is come and get treated, come in to get care, because once you once you're undetectable, definitely you can reduce the risk greatly of transmitting the virus to someone else. I mean. Back in the days, do you all remember about the Magic Johnson? Yes. Okay. Yes. Magic Johnson, that's a clear example. Right? When he said, oh, I don't have HIV anyone, he came up with him, he was killed. He was killed. That was the most important thing about the And so, you're undetectable. And when you're undetectable, you cannot transmit the virus to someone else. And now, a pregnant a woman could have a baby. That was our next question. Like, how do you start families yeah, with you living with the thing that's virus? A woman who's HIV, who's HIV, positive and it's undetectable, she can have a baby. Back, back in the days, it was, as soon as an HIV, a lady is HIV positive and she's pregnant, it was gonna be, she has to have a C-section. But with the appropriate care, and she becoming undetectable, she can have regular vaginal growth. And so, with the care that is provided by Federal Health Care and the Department of Health, we can make people undetectable. And as well, similar to FHC, where you could come and get tested, Every day, the department of not on Saturdays as yet, um, but Monday to Friday, you can get tested uh, with free HIV testing. And the tests that are provided on both sites are rapid HIV tests, where you can get the results. Depending on the test that's used within as little, the results can be interpreted as quick as one minute and as many as 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. taking care of a young lady uh, with HIV and she wanted to have another baby and she did. She came into early treatment, she was unaware, and so she was, her, her, her CD4 count was always healthy. She was always healthy and had undetectable levels of the virus. She became pregnant and I knew she wanted to, there was, I mean, I, I couldn't tell her don't have sex to cover up and you with her partner. They had sex. They were both undetectable. And they had a wonderful young man and um, she's still undetectable and we're working on the other, one of the things I must say, you get good care here if you're an HIV yes. because the care is very integrated. Um, <laughs> accidental system. You see this person for that, that person for that, and the, the providers are not always talking to each other. Medications are not always on board with each other. So in some ways, HIV treatment and a holistic, integrative healthcare system keeps that in check. And that's sort of like what we do. We take care of you. If you have diabetes, we take care of you with that. If you have hypertension, because there are a lot of people that get all these other diseases and get HIV but they get a comprehensive place to come to that looks at all of this and treats the whole body and the whole person. And in many ways, I think that's some of the best healthcare you're gonna get in any place in the United States, whether it's here or in the mainland.
The next, the next question we'll go to is how has medicine changed over the years for you? How have you seen it progress? Medicine has been amazing. It's been a wonderful journey. Like I said, we started getting it in 2000. And in the beginning, when we were taking it, we were taking like 16 pills a day. Now, uh, clients can take one pill a day. Yes! Woo! I'm not there yet, but hopefully soon I will be to the one pill a day. That's what we're working on now with my provider. But the health care we get here is just totally awesome. awesome. It is totally awesome. We can't thank our providers enough for the love, care, and assistance and support that they give us. We just can't do it without you all. And you equals you, that is a blessing for women living with HIV. Because there are so many women having babies now that has an undetectable viral load. They're not spreading it to their partners and they're having their children, making their dreams come true. So it's awesome. It's been a long way to break down. A very long way. Jason wanted to add. Yeah, and just to add to the medication as well too, it's also very important that individuals who are HIV positive take their medication. Every day. And do exactly every day. And the reason being is that, as you hear, there are different medications out there now we have individuals where you can take one pill a day. But however, you can't get to that if you've not been taking any other medications because what happened, your body could build, HIV is so smart, it builds up, it tends to build up resistance. And so if you're not taking that medication, and then what happened, then your body builds up resistance, then they gotta try in a different medication. And then when you stop, then they gotta try in something else. And then so what happened, you gotta take, be consistent with your medication. And if not, then it fails. The attitude to that is that these medications are related to each other, they're constant. Cousins, third and fourth degree cousins. So when you get resistant to your medication, you can become resistant to many other medications. Yes. I have a lady now, she is she is fabulous. And she went through a time when she, you know you get pill fatigue, popular pill every day. Mm -hmm. And you get pill fatigue. And she had other social issues and you know went off plane and you know, became resistant to many medications. And right now, she's on nine different medic. I don't even know how she remembers it. But one day, I cha they changed her to the generic, and she called me and said, this is not her medication. Da -da -da. It was a Saturday, and one of our DIS workers went out, and I spoke to the pharmacy, and I cleared it up with her. But this is an example of what can happen. So you have to be committed to taking that medication. Now I have another client. She is a, a, a professional woman. She was married and was infected by her husband with that and many other things. And she divorced and found out she was not only with these other sexually transmitted diseases, but she also was HIV positive. She was, you know, she got herself together, you know, and, her, uh, and uh, but she doesn't <coughs> refuses to tell her children, even though her present husband knows she has a wonderful job. And my issue is just getting her to take her medication because she feels that if she doesn't think about it, it's going to go no, away. No. So it's important to take your medication every day because once you get you become resistant. It can be problematic getting you on a good regimen exactly. because of the interconnectedness of these medications. Yeah. So let's talk about PrEP a little bit. Since we're talking about oh, you wanted to I was, add. I was, no, I was about to start, start about, talking about oh, PrEP. Well, so I mean, you're right on top of it. Let's go on. <laughs> well, let me just, uh, I'll just lead into it. So according to the CDC, um, PrEP is a preventative tablet that according to the organization, again, is provided um, when people at very high risk for HIV, um, if they take it daily, that they can prevent HIV. Yes, so there's, I mean, medications, again, has advanced so much um, from when HIV epidemic started to now. There's a pill that you take once a day, every day, it's called PrEP. Um, and as long as you take it once a day, every day, on a daily basis, you eliminate the risk of you contracting HIV. Now the thing is, just because you're eliminating the risk of you contracting HIV does not mean you can't get any other STDs or any other STIs. So just because you are taking a pill, it, it is recommended to 
use protection as well. Um, but for that extra barrier, if you are want to be promiscuous and if you are whatever reason it may be for not wanting to use condoms, to eliminate the risk, there is a pill called prep. Take it once a day, every day, and you eliminate it. Um, not only that, but then there's also a pill called NPEP, which is similar to Plan B. So if you feel like you've been contracted or got contracted with HIV within 48 to 70, 72 hours, um, you're able to take this pill and it eliminates the facts of getting the virus, the risk of getting the virus. Now, reduces the risk of getting the virus. Now, there's a whole Say process. Say once more, once more. Reduces the risk. No, but what, what is the name of the medication? Oh, MPEP. MPEP. And where do you, where do persons purchase that? So you can get that from your primary health care. So, purchase the health care I know has a prep and a prep program that we do do referrals for clients that want to get on it. Um, sure, Department of Health as well, correct? So, so there's prep and PEP. Pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. So pre, again, is individuals who are HIV negative, who hopefully want to have sex and prevent themselves from acquiring the disease. So we actually could be with a person who's HIV positive and a person who's HIV negative, and that's one way where that one person with HIV negative person can be taken prep to help them prevent them from reducing the risk of getting the virus. PEP, primarily for healthcare providers, uh, individuals who probably may have been stuck accidentally by a needle, those individuals could actually turn it to provider to their workplace to be replaced by PEP. Additionally, um, in the, in, when we see we have a women's coalition here, and they're strong advocates for sexual assault victims, that's another aid avenue for individuals who have been sexually assaulted. So individuals who have been sexually assaulted, we encourage them to be placed on PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, prevent them or to reduce the risk of acquiring disease. And it's not, it has to be taken at least a month, at least a month every day to reduce the risk of acquiring disease. We had a previous conversation leading up to this event as well. For persons, we can't deal with all the emotional stuff that's going on at homes um, as healthcare professionals, but for women who may be in relationships where things may not be ideal at home and your husband or significant other, that ideally will work for them well if sometimes they are forced into sexual, having sexual um, engagement um, in your household. Um, so if you, you know that your husband might have a risky behavior, that would also be an avenue for them as well? You know, actually that's, a, that's an interesting twist to it. I think that, that yes, that could be done. Um, as a female, you have the right to say no. Um, but of course, you're married, and of course, the husband may think that he has the right. So you have women's coalition behind there. Correct. So we're not saying that the husbands do have the right. We're just Correct. saying we, as a preventative measure. But the, yes, that's one avenue that the female can use, take a medication to help her to reduce her risk. So the I said earlier, that's just HIV, there are the other cities out there that... And I also want to place that it always it doesn't always have to be men as well, because I don't want to see men from coming across. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, it could also be the other way around. <laughs> right. For LGBT, it's important for me to really speak that because unfortunately, we live in a patriarchal, male-oriented culture. As such, women define themselves by the men in their lives. So a man does not have a right to whether he's husband, chief, doctor, or what, to your sexual pleasures if you choose not to, even in a marriage and a relationship. Correct! Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Correct! No is no. Correct. Sometimes no. you just don't want to be bothered. Correct! And you have that right. And please, that's one thing I just wanted to emphasize. You have that right. And another thing I must share with my sisters is that Instead of fighting with each other over who is the first or who is the number one, yeah. we really need to value ourselves and get to know someone, male, female, yeah. whatever, whoever you are, yeah. you choose. your gender or your love is your business, it's not mine. Who you love is not my business. Yeah. Okay. Okay? My business is keeping you from getting communicable diseases of any kind. And for you to value yourself, to make a choice, to say, before I am going to sleep with you, and you have to be that way in 2019. Yes. We yes. have to have a relationship for some time. We 
go and we have counseling and we get tested. Like I told my children, you know, you only get HIV one time, you know. So you have, and I said that to my daughter, you value yourself. Get tested, go to counseling. I said, you, I'm your mother. You, li I, you live in my house. You, I've been doing this since you were born. You come to me. Anything you want to know, you come to me. If, even if you want drugs, you come to me. Because I have a lot of patients that are drug dealers. <laughs> I lived in Boston. I lived in the city. That's where I practice. Come to me. I know. I know. I know. And so it's important for us to have this conversation because your girls are going to do it. Don't tell them, oh, this is your this and that. Talk to our children, our babies. This is your vagina. This is your penis. Yes. Yes. That makes you proud. We have to talk to our children like in baby talk. We have to have our own values clarification and providers and health clinics personnel need to do that also. We have to do that across the board. Get tested, not once. One test is no testing. So how much time should you get, get so tested a year? I told, I told my children you get tested. You know, three, four testings a year is important because your test that you take today that's negative doesn't tell you about who have you had sex with the day before. So leading to that, how easy is it for you to get medicine or not not able to get medicine and how expensive it is? How is health uh, for instance, health clinic involved in helping with uh, the financial needs? You started at 3.40 p.m. You were part of that plan, so why not speak on it? <laughs> so access to medication is pretty much easy and cheap and free, primarily for individuals HIV positive. Free, that, that's, that's what I said, free. Um, yeah, not cheap, there's a cost, but overall the, the cost of it is expensive, but however, the HIV positive patient is free. Uh, as back to the professional health care, yes, the professional health care has a program, which is the 340B program, uh, that helps individuals who are HIV positive, and other people who also have You're watching the Virgin Islands Consortium. Uh, soon we will be going offline. Uh, you're currently watching the, uh, and so an HIV AIDS event and being held in Fredericksburg. Similar as well to the Department of Health has a program that's called the AIDS program. So individuals who have HIV positive as well to AIDS drug assistance program this is a World AIDS Day event uh, being put together by uh, the Public State Healthcare. Again, we'll be going offline very soon. And so, with the, the ADAP program is eligible for everyone, similar to the 340B program that also provides that medication. They're both different to an extent, but having access to both programs that both entities have. The Department of Health has a 340B program. We purchase medication at 340B prices more too, but it's different. But however, having access to both the ADA and the 340B drug assistance program definitely ensures that all, of, all patients get access to free medication. So you, you come in, you get tested. If in fact if you are uh, found to have HIV, then there, that's when the work begins. Yes. And so I'm not sure what the specific protocol at FHC is, but however, once an individual, you can determine before, so an individual gets tested positive, and initially, they're preliminary positive. The tests that we're using are rapid HIV tests, and two rapid HIV tests only like the person HIV positive. So once you have two HIV tests, at that point in time, the, proper, the social worker could say, you know what, we are gonna enroll you in care right away and get, get you started on medication right away, and then go ahead and work and get confirmatory. So right away, immediately, that person could get that medication. Once they prescribed, can receive medication that same day if the protocol has decided yes, two positives, we're gonna enroll that person with you right away, or depending if they're gonna wait for that confirmed positive to come back with regards to the environment and see if it works. We, what we try to do is get people tested immediately so we can get you started on treatment right away. And there's no medication you can get treated right away. So wild virus, it most certainly can be treated because more than likely you're assuming that person is pan-sensitive, meaning that they can take, they're sensitive to any of the medication. So you can, I sometimes like to wait because I like to see how 
if how people are. I do want to know their CD4 count and their viral load. And that predicates how long I may stay to get a uh, test of what medications they're sensitive to. But if someone comes in to me and they have obvious AIDS, and I've had someone, people come in and they have obvious AIDS, I am not going to wait. I am going to just jump into the muddy water and get that person well because I know if I don't, they will die. And then I would treat with everything else that they may come up with if they have hepatitis B, you know, gonorrhea, you know, because these other STIs continue to weaken their systems. And that's another thing I want to say to black women, just one thing, we tend to douche. Please stop douching. Okay, promise me, when you leave here today, the vagina is self-cleaning. Stop using antibacterial soap. Amen. It exposes you to sexually transmitted disease because it kills all your vaginal flora. Please, okay? Stop douching. Our mothers and our grandmothers told us that, but those are not true things. You don't have to clean out after your period, and taking a douche is not going to get keep you from getting pregnant if you don't get pregnant. It's going to put you at risk for STIs, and it weakens your ability to fight diseases in Okay. Red House Condo member CDC is planning to eradicate the HIV AIDS virus in 10 years. And so at this time, um, we're going to have the CEO of the Furniture Health Healthcare um, Center to provide us with a point. So if we could have Ms. Brown Webster. Thank you. 